Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Real Hacker RS podcast. Today we're going to continue working on the static bug finder. However, we're going to be trying to add detection for a new, t yeah, for a bug type that is radically different than all the bug types that we currently have support for in here. And let me show you what I mean by that. So, right now, all of the bug types that have been implemented within Fallon Mixed, they're all based around a function call. What this is, is it's a bug type that isn't based around any type of function call. And we see here, this is the function. It's effectively void vol. It's effectively just a basic star copy it takes in a char pointer or and it will iterate through each character of that char array until it reaches with null byte, copying the each byte to this char buffer without checking if it is going out of bounds. I want to be able to detect bugs like this. So how can we do this? Um right now Phalanx has two different methods of going through and actually searching for bugs. The first method is it will just iterate through all of the different references that are made or calls made to the functions that we actually want to analyze and look at it that way. Since this is a bug that isn't at all tied to any function call, that isn't going to help us. However, the second bug finding method or search method that we have code points where it's effectively we give it an address and it will effectively look at that function that calls that address and just scan through it. That method will look at all of the instructions and P codes of that function just scan literal or linearly and that's what I'm going to go with. So effectively right now what I've done is if you scroll down here Okay, here, this is the old code for the, what do you call it? The code point scanning, effectively what I'm doing, yeah, this is just iterating through every function and then iterating through every P code of the function till it's a call instruction. I'm just offloading this functionality to the code iterator class since we already have a all object that is supposed to handle iterating through code. However, this one's going to be a bit different than the one I used to generate contexts for functions being called, since this should iterate through all of the P codes, whereas that one it would only iterate up until a call. And actually, let's scroll a little bit up. So here, can we at all scan? Okay, never mind. That's not going to work. Let's just go to iterate code path. Okay, cool. So here is a function. This is a function that's actually responsible for iterating through each of the co um, P codes. Um, it looks fairly similar to um, the one that I have down here for iterating until a function call, iterate until a call. However, the difference with it, well, one difference with this that we're going to have to have. So in order to detect um, this type of bug right here, how I imagine at least doing the preliminary check is we will need to effectively identify what a loop is going to look like. And actually, let me show you what I mean. So let's print out the P codes for this before I ex explain further what I'm thinking. Okay, we can see here are all the P codes for the function. Thing is this branch instruction right into here, the conditional branch. While I don't know which P code it is, it's going to jump to a P code up here and then iterate down. Why is it going to do that? Because, let me see. 
Okay. This while loop, it will continually jump to the beginning of this loop as long as this condition is met. So that's going to be reflected in the P codes. I know for what we did with iterating into a function call, how we dealt with, well, typically how we do with a conditional branch is we just fork both ways without any regard to what the condition is. That way we can see what happens if we go down either code path. Issue with this with a loop is since it continually jumps back up here and goes down, hits the conditional branch again. Because of that, um, unless if we have some condition that will effectively check for loops, it'll just get stuck in an infinite loop where it just keeps on spawning uh, an out, well, spawning method to go and just look at the top of the loop. How we dealt with this when we were iterating through a single function call, or iterating to a function call, I should say, is we just had a hash set that just keep track of which P codes or addresses, I forget, actually, which one is it? P codes or addresses. Nope, it was in here. It was permission context called program I function function to analyze calling func. So, what was it? Oh, we kept track of the index. Oh, yeah. When you're iterating, iterating through the P codes, we iterate by index. So like this P code would have index zero, index one, index two, so on and so forth. And we just check, have we looked at this P code index before? We have, okay, this is a private little loop, just kill this analysis branch. Now, getting back to why that's relevant here is how, part of how we can detect if this is in out of index array, out of bounds caused by a, the index pointer being incremented in a loop. We need to be able to analyze a loop because re reality is looking at this code or the P codes, we aren't going to really know if it's a loop until we see, hey, this code path, it's jumping back to code that we already looked at. This is a loop. And then looking at that method, we can determine that, hey, th this, these P codes are executed in a loop. So what my plan to do to tackle that is change it from a hash set to a hash map. What will that do for us? That will allow us, we'll have the value 0B. This is a P code that we've never seen before. A, P, a value of 1, meaning we've looked at this once beforehand and a value of two, meaning we've looked at this twice. That way, when we're iterating through, the first time it'll all be zeros. We hit this conditional branch, which jumps us back up to here. We go up to that P code and we see that that value is now one. We now know, hey, this P code is, these P codes are within a loop. We can analyze these P instructions with that context. And then we go back and hit this conditional branch again and try to jump back up to the start of the P codes, we see that, hey, these P codes are already two, not, or the value is two, not only are these P codes in a loop, we've already looked at there, we don't need to look at that at them again and call it an infinite loop, we can just kill this analysis branch. So that's how I plan on tackling that. No. How do I? Actually, is same indices. Same indices. I want to see where this is. I might just be able to. Hash set. Huh. Hash map. Integer. Indices same count equals new hash map. Just realized I made a typo here. Actually, it'll just be better 
if we just convert this over this hash set to a hash map. That, that would just make things simpler and probably prevent a few problems. Integer now. Okay, let's iterate through all the calls to seen indices that way you can convert it. Equals new. This should be a hash map. Integer, integer. Okay, that's that. Contain, this should be contains key dot put. This is going to be one. This, is, this should be contains key. I need to register sublime text. I'll do that after the stream. I uh, recently had to redo my work VM so that's why sublime text is not licensed actually I'll go ahead and do that right now I'm going to pause the stream and do that okay I'm back as you can see there's no longer the unregistered sublime text message in the header right here so it is registered okay now back to where where was I oh yeah I was changing scene indices from a hash set to a hash map okay that wait no this should be a hash map okay that should do it let's go ahead and run it and see if we messed anything if it crashes we mess something if it doesn't crash we probably did it right okay it ran that's good So this is the entire P codes as seen. Here it iterates until a conditional branch. Okay, cool. And then it iterates through these. Okay, so right now, let's go ahead and implement the logic for this iterate code path. So right now with how we had the current code path iteration is if it's looking at P codes that we've already seen before then just exit entirely we do not want to do that so if it contains the key if this dot scene indices dot get or default i negative one is let me write this as equal to one in should in for loop be equals to true else Actually, let's just return from here. And let's make the variable in loop. Then in loop equals false. And let's set this equal to false here. <sighs> okay, so what does this code that will do? It checks here that if it if we have seen this value before, it is going to be in the hash map. If it's in the hash map and the value is equal to 1, meaning that we've looked at it once beforehand, set the variable in the loop equal to true. Otherwise, return the function. Why return it? Because if it's not, if we haven't looked at it before, it hasn't been placed in the hash map since it gets placed right here, meaning that it shouldn't be there, meaning that it should this code shouldn't execute this code should only execute if we're looking at code for a third or a fourth or whatever time in which case i don't want to analyze it again because i need to stop it to not cause an infinite loop and it really doesn't give me anything after the second run through so i'm just returning from there and this variable in the loop i'm setting it that equal to true or the setting that variable reason for that being actually i just realized something 
this. I'm going to have a small problem that I just thought of, but I'll worry about that later. This variable in loop, I could just use that as I'm processing each of the P codes, just so I know, am I in a loop? I am in a loop, cool, I can uh, look at these P codes differently since like, some of these P codes like incrementing an integer that gets used as an index, might not care about that as much, at least in this context, if it's not in a loop. The problem I just thought of is, actually, so let's say we're iterating through here, we reach a C branch, one, it, it forks for both ways I can go. One continues down here, the other jumps up here and goes through here and then it'll reach the conditional branch and then it will fork the one up here, since I've already looked at this code two times, and that will be the third time that will return itself. However, it will also fork down to these P codes below, which I've only looked at this P codes once in this context, so it will look at that as if it's a loop. Now, what I can do to prevent that, that I just thought, is this only, this edge case will only present itself if I try to look at a conditional branch a second time, so, which I have this lovely in loop variable, so I can just only fork from a conditional branch if I'm not in a loop. So let's go ahead and if in loop, that this should take care of that edge case. I think I need these. Why did I have those? Just watch commenting out those two lines is going to cause some massive problem. Probably will. I had the branch have the continue because that's doing a jump somewhere. I have a later on. There's a thing where I'll increment the index to the next one. I yeah, don't really think I need. I'm just going to leave a comment it out and see what will happen. Let's try running this now and just seeing what will happen. With, now that we have, we changed how it handles repeated code. Okay. These are the P codes that are initially ran. These are the P codes that are, well, up to the first conditional branch, then immediately following it, and then the final ones. It's not actually, oh, I commented out the uh, code to actually iterate through it. That's probably gonna be a problem. No wonder why it's not going back and analyzing the loop as is. Let's see, okay, first populating the P codes, iterating until the branch, populating them again, I need to change that so it doesn't keep repopulating the P codes. Return call, return, what, that's weird. Some that shouldn't be happening. We should be getting 
some of the P codes from here in the linear order, not these P codes. That's messed up. Let's make sure iterate code path, yeah. Let's see, what does this make branch call? Let me get the following issues here. New iterator dot i is equal to i. What is Let's see, what is the index that it's resolving to? Maybe that has a problem. Index 5, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It should be iterating from here. Wait a second. In I. Is this dot I? Yeah, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What's at the end of this? It's i plus equals to 1. I get the feeling that there's some... Get the feeling that there's something else messing with the iteration count because what does it start off with? Let's see. What is the index that it starts off with? Let's run this one last time. This should give us the introspection we need to determine what the problem is here. Why it's not iterating through the P codes the way we want it to. So it starts with index zero. And add, okay, load, cast, copy, all the way to the C branch. Okay, cool. Then it determines that it's index 5, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Add register 30 and 10, not OX 1, 10, and 28. Let's double check it. No, that is not what's going on. It's starting, it's saying, what is going on here? Okay, I just realized something that I should have realized earlier that might be causing the problems. There's a branch in P code right here that's probably going to jump down somewhere into here. And do I, I do have branch enabled. I do. So branch will jump down to these multi equals here. Signed extend add cast load sign extend cast not equal and then jump back up to the int add right here.
Let's start jumping back into that one. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it should be. Yeah, this the rest of the video is probably just gonna be debugging this issue, whatever it is. Uh, let's see what it is. Added. So, oh, wait, zero, five. Hmm. I'm going to add a little, like, what it's almost looking like. Because here, index five zero one two three four five is a signed extent. However, it's giving me this add here when I try to do five. It almost looks like we're losing a P code here. So I'm just going to add a simple print statement here. And I'll just print out the first couple of P codes. Plus. Okay, this this should tell us. We're looking to see if effectively the first like five or six P codes do match up with what we expect them to be. First time around we see Okay, we see that in add load cast copy branch assign extend exactly what I expect it to be. Then it iterates through it gets it hits the call branch. Why is this we holds true? Oh my gosh, I not actually iterating through the next one. <sighs> This is going to be a fun project, a fun problem to solve. Okay, I'm just going to copy these P codes over to another screen and stop printing them out every time to make our output look a little better. Let's have these here, and let's get rid of this filler text. So those are the P codes, great. Now, let's get rid of this print statement right here. Cool, that leaves us with, we should just be able to see the P codes that it or iterates through here and compare them against the p codes that we have here statically there cool so you can see here starts with integer add load cast all the way down hits this branch 
and it goes to a multi equal and then to this conditional branch. which it will then jump to the sign extend, which maps with that index correctly. And iterate through it until it hits this conditional branch. Is that a similar, where is the conditional branch here? C branch. Okay, cool, that is a similar span that we've seen. And we also see that it doesn't appear to be forking there, which, oh, of course it wouldn't fork because this code right here, so it jumped back up, it realizes that it is in a loop and because of that, it doesn't do the additional fork because it would cause that weird problem where the uh, code outside of the loop would get analyzed multiple times and treated as if it was a loop, but it's not in a loop. That's good. Then we hit this one conditional branch, which is the first time. We fork down. Go down this way, maybe. Oh, wait, no, no. This one returns. I'll cause that one. And this other path would. So this path is the one that calls the function that happens when you fail the secondary check. Or maybe not. Maybe what? Both? Why? What is this one here? So this conditional branch. Return, return. says it is resolving to index 34, which should be this return instruction right here. Do I have a code for a return instruction? I do not think I do. Let me go ahead and add it here. If I hit a return instruction, it should just end or stop iteration. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and run this now. Let's see if it works. Also, let's get rid of this uh, print statement up here that prints out the first 5p codes because we do not need it and it frankly is just distracting. And although I'm going to keep the statement to print the starting index for a new branch. Start with 0, jump up to 5, that's good, and then this conditional branch Is it seeing this as a return opcode? I wonder. Because this return constant zero, that's right here, return constant one four, but it shouldn't be iterating like that. There's an issue here. So, something's not right. If it prints that statement, we know that it is recognizing it as a return instruction, but it isn't because it's return not returning. This shouldn't
Okay, I think I see what the problem is here. So this conditional branch, it's branching to here and here. Those are the two places it forks to. In first case, it branches to here, sees it's the return instruction and just returns. And then we continue on branching from here. It's a call instruction and then a return. And for some reason, why would it do that? For some reason, when it hits the second return, this function returns, but it goes back up to. Oh, I get it now. So, this goes back to part of the issue we have with looking at loop detection code. So, first time we go through here, first pass, we go through these P codes, hit this branch op code, go down to these multi equals, go through, hit this conditional branch. At this point, we make a fork. Uh, so a separate function to analyze it that goes down one path. This path goes up to here, iterates all the way through, sees this is a conditional branch that we already all marked it for analysis with both forks, and we're like, we're not going to do that again. And it's going to iterate down here to this conditional branch. Okay, cool. Iterates this one, okay, and then iterates these two. And that's it. However, this conditional branch, we've only, that entire way, way is just one path that we've iterated down. We haven't done the other. So then after that's all said and done, we start iterating back down from here, this other path as if the condition was not met. How we can solve this is right now for this conditional branch we have it. If it is not in a loop, we do that. What instead we can do is we see or we say if it is in a loop, just kill the current code path anal or analysis along this particular code path. That way, what that should do that way, when we loop back, where is this? When you loop back up here and go all the way down and hit this, that code path analysis gets killed in the other conditional as if the other path was taken, then steps over from there. That should fix the problem if I'm visualizing what's going on correctly. Let's see if it iterates correctly. Starts with integer add, cool, branch, branch goes down, multi equal, that's correct. Iterates down until it hits this conditional branch, goes back into the sonic stone. Iterates down until it hits the conditional branch, returns, iterates down to this other conditional branch, goes to the return, returns, goes back to right before the branch where there's a call and return. Okay. So, we got the code path iteration working in that regard. So, effectively, I'm just going to go over one more time to show how we're iterating through here. Starting through here, going down, hitting this branch. With this branch, we are jumping to this multi equal. This multi equal, we're only going down to this conditional branch at which we are forking. Um, a separate 
code iteration process. This process is jumping up to, where is it? The signed extend and going all the way down here until it hits this conditional branch. Seeing that we have already looked at this conditional branch, that new conditional branch process is being killed. And then we go back to the original one and then we see, okay, we looked one, we looked at one of the paths on this fork, let's look at the other. And then go down here and see this is a conditional branch. We look down on one path, which brings us to this return instruction, it just returns okay. Then we look on the other path, which brings us to this call and this return. So, took us long enough, but we finally got code iteration working for loops. And then that brings us to the next problem of actually determining how to identify when something, when this type of oper risky operation is taking place. But since this video has been going on for 41 minutes, I'm going to cut it here. Thank you for watching.